and I think when you can get into that field and understand the business, it's really, it's a lot of fun. So that's a great way to open this quick in the studio segment. This is uh, going to be extracts from a recent conversation I and my students at the law school had with Janice Innes Thompson. She is a senior VP of corporate litigation and legal operations at Nationwide Insurance. We talk a lot about the business of law and how understanding the business both as being in-house counsel is an advantage, but really outside counsel and the law firms and the lawyers that she's choosing to work with and others are choosing to work with at Nationwide. How do you differentiate? What is your competitive advantage? What is your value proposition? We say these words often inside law firms, but we don't really do a good job of actually articulating what truly is different and better about working with this lawyer or this practice group at this law firm versus another. There's a lot in this conversation I've tried to extract and hopefully it'll help you get a better sense or sharpen your vision a little bit and how you might rethink your approach to your clients. You know, if you hire the right people, I'm not going to sit there and tell you like how to draw, how to write your brief. You know, hopefully you know how to write your brief. Um, what I think is important for in-house counsel to do is to make sure the company's personality shows up in that brief. So that's what I'm kind of waiting for is, are you addressing this issue in a way that is true to the values um, and the reputation of this organization? So the company's personality is the key. Uh, when So I think when I'm looking at this, I expect the law firms to get me the right law, you know, get me the right precedent, draft the, you know, the brief or draft the motion for summary judgment or the motion to dismiss. Um, and then what I want to bring to it, if the law firm doesn't know my company well enough, I want to bring that company personality to um, that brief. Then you let the law firm go and do the work and you work with them on how is it positioning the company best. Now, the other side of that, the outside firms, we have to think they're getting paid you know, for the time they, they spend on your work. And so thing I was, um, I, and I do now, I'm very mindful of is, I wanna review what it is you're doing. And if I'm working with a law firm that I think is just billing for the sake of billing, we're gonna have a, half, we're gonna have a tough conversation. Um, I, I recently had to have a tough conversation with a big law firm um, where they were literally just running up the bill. And I was like, I want a motion for summary judgment. I would like it next week. And this guy was trying to dig into the facts and he was trying to dig. And I was like, do you understand if there is a question, an issue of fact, I don't get summary judgment. So let's not do fact digging. I want motion for summary judgment. And so that's some of the stuff that I'm doing now, but he, for him, if it, you know, if we don't get the motion for summary judgment, um, and we would probably end up settling this case at some point, but we would have spent half a million dollars or five million dollars on discovery, and this guy's hourly rate is twelve hundred dollars an hour. So some really great insights here. You hear her talk about knowing the personality of the company, of the client, right, and why that's so important. And you hear her actually say, "Listen, we're assuming you know how to write a brief or a memo. We." understand that you want to get to the facts and the legal challenge, but you've got to reflect us and our point of view and our personality. Don't get so caught up in being a lawyer that you forget to be our business partner and understand us. We say this all the time, know the client, but so many people struggle to know what that actually means. And we're taught to be lawyers and we're taught to think about the law and issue spot and identify facts and try to wrap the law to the facts in a way that best benefits our client. But seldom do we ask, well, how does the client want to be viewed by the public, by, you know, the, you know, the court, the, uh, the court of public opinion, anybody, they have a distinct personality. They want to proceed in a certain way, depending on the matter, depending on the context. And unless we're savvy to that, unless we're listening and understanding our client, we're going to miss that completely. You know, she talks about one firm that was running up the bill, a, a big law firm, and and the lawyers, the lead lawyers, bill rate was twelve hundred dollars an hour. And she says, "Listen, I understand that you know you're going to probably make a lot of money doing this, and if we proceed your way, we're still going to settle because we want a motion for summary judgment. We don't want this matter around." So there was a misalignment of incentives there, and 
that is the opening. That is where, as a competitor law firm or lawyer, you need to be paying close attention to what's happening in the market and where that might be happening, where one law firm, your competitor is like losing the forest from the trees because that is your opening. You're going to hear more on that here in a second. Hey, do me a favor. I'm just starting to build this channel and building the content. It will help me out a lot. If you like this and subscribe to this channel, it'd be great. Thank you so much. And that was the beauty about moving to 16 law firms. Okay, did you catch that? She just said she's reduced all her law firms down to 16 primary law firms. Let me just break that down real quick. So originally they had 180 when she joined Nationwide. They've just reduced it down to 16, from 180 to 16 primary, and they have 32 secondary or specialized firms. So you want to talk about differentiation and competitive advantage? How do you get on that list of 16 when you were one of those 180? And what happened to those, you know, other ones that didn't get selected? They didn't differentiate. They didn't treat their client nationwide like a business partner. Just want to make sure you caught that. And that was the beauty about moving to 16 law firms. I have great data right now. Um, I know, it, and, and we also had to do a lot of socializing within Nationwide um, because Nationwide has a lot of lawyers. So on the corporate side of Nationwide, we have probably 539 lawyers. Um, and so we, and not all of them are hiring um, law firms, but so we had to make sure that they knew we're going to these 16. So I can track who has not gone to these 16 and who has, and we're holding people accountable for it, which I think is, has been good. And part of the reason for going with these 16 is that we did have um, alternative fee arrangements um, with many of them, and we are looking at a true partnership. So um, some of the firms have come in and done CLEs for the law department. So that saved us you know, a tremendous amount of money. Um, one of the firm is actually, we hired three new people straight out of law school recently. One of these firms has a um, new lawyer training program. They're gonna roll our people into their new lawyer training program. Um, and and we, you know, we do community events with them. So they understand and know who we are. And I'm happy to say that you know, a lot of the motions that I've reviewed, and I don't get to review many of them, just in the larger, more significant cases now, um, our firm's personality is very well represented um, in the work because we have partners who know us. She now has partners who know us, know us the client. And so you see that those firms that won, that won the client out of all those 180, now they're one of 16 and they did so because they invested in the client to really understand them. Now, I'm going to give you a tool and you're going to hear Janice talk about sort of what she has done to help understand the business, but it's key and it's not that challenging. Yes, you got to invest some time to understand the business, but it's definitely achievable. And here's the secret. Most lawyers spend almost no time doing it. And those lawyers who don't do know the client, they they know it because they've been working with the client so long and they generally won't share that information for other lawyers. So you've got to find that out for yourself, even if you're an associate working on a matter within a law firm. Do the work to try to figure out and learn more about the client. Because here's the thing, when you learn about the client, then you look inside your own firm, you look inside your own practice group, you look inside yourself and you start taking inventory of what what do you have? What do you have access to that the client might value? You know, Janice mentioned they have alternative fees. Okay, maybe maybe as a non-partner, you're not going to be able to control pricing. Okay, just keep it in the back of your mind. Think about how the client wants to buy legal services. She mentioned CLEs and training. Are there any ideas to do unique training? For instance, I know one large law firm, Amlaw 50 firm, helped um, not just one company, but two companies with their burgeoning legal operations team. They didn't necessarily teach them how to do legal operations, but how do you work with data, the data that law firms have, the data that in-house counsel have? How do you clean it? How do you just get it into Excel field so you can do something with it? How might you visualize it using different tools? Just bare bones, down to earth, just tactical stuff. But that's immensely valuable because there's there's not a lot of resources for that out in the market, especially for an in-house team that doesn't have a lot of extra money to go send someone to training or to even spend the time to find good training. 
Also talked about community events and shared causes that can bring you together as well. But there's a whole host of opportunities out there for you to get to know your client better. And how do you sort of do that? And how do you pull out those kernels of insight? We'll get to that here in a second, but you're hearing from Janice why it matters so much. And she's going to tell you here in a second how she goes about doing it because she has to do it as well. You know, I do. There are very few companies that you go into that I'm going to have a lot of great information about the company itself, like on their websites. Um, I find myself right now because I'm very curious. Um, it's very self-directed. Um, and I think it's important for it to be self-directed. I don't think I could be successful at what I do if I didn't understand the company and its business. But there is no one, you know, when you get your orientation from HR, they're not going to go, oh, here's the company and its business, right? Um, so one of the things I do with public companies when I'm working, um, when I'm going to work for a public company, um, if you read their 10Ks and their 10Qs, and so from some of the law firms that I work with, I'll say, well, if you want to really learn the, the company's personality and what risk tolerance it has, go read the K. Um, you know, and it, it really will give you a lot of good information. That's where I start with a lot of companies. Nationwide, as a mutual, I searched and searched. And the last K they had was in 2010, because that's when they folded in the financial services part into the mutual. So they have no documents out there. So one of the things I did at Nationwide, you know, because when you first start in a role, yes, there are things that you're addressing, but it's not taking up your whole day. And so I would literally go on the website, look at org charts. I, I still do from time to time and just kind of read whatever the business is doing. We have like, you know, a landing page where they talk about new deals that we've come out with and explains some of the business. Um, Nationwide also has a good archive. I know I've read some of the books written by people who left Nationwide just to get a better sense. But I, I do think it's important for you to take that initiative because I, I don't believe anyone's going to say, here you go. You know? Okay, so you just heard what Janice said. As soon as she goes into a new company, she immediately starts digging into the company to learn its culture, to learn its systems, to learn its business, to learn its customers, to learn its leadership, to learn its org chart. There's a multitude of resources for anyone out there to do that digging. Yes, in public companies, go to their public filings. Absolutely, but don't stop there. For private companies, you don't have the benefit of that, but you have to use other things. There's a plethora of things. That's why they in, in, uh, invented the internet for crying out loud. Even reading glass door ratings from former employees. Yes, there's a lot of you know bad hurt feelings on there, but there's some truth there too. Um, look at press releases and don't just read the press release, go a level deeper with something they mention in the press release to try to find latest news. I always say set up Google alerts to get automatic postings on this stuff. Um, do research on one of the company's biggest customers. Um, if they mention any of the customers, there's a there's a wealth of information out there. So yes, it'd be easy to just stop there and say, well, go do that and then get smarter on the company. There's a lot of different ways to organize this. I just want to give you one simple way, right? So you just want four boxes, four categories, right? The first category when you're doing research is just really think about who is the most ideal customer for the company. Like if they could choose any type of customer out there in the world, who would be like the perfect match from personality to how they want to buy to the problem they're solving to how they're solving it right. Think about who that company would say is their best perfect customer. And then what kind of offering does that company make them? Meaning what's the best offering they get to their best client. That's sort of in one category. Just start keeping track of that. Yes, you may have more than one customer. Look at Amazon. They have they have several dozens, if not hundreds of different customer types. It's okay. You don't have to get them all. You're just starting to learn about the company, right? So that's one box. I always put it below that. What's the most ideal employee? Describe the, uh, the ideal employee for that company. We know that different companies have different personalities laid back, gunner mentality, um, intellectual, uh, more creative, not that those things are opposed or anything like that, but think about the ideal employee that they want to attract. If they could have all their employees of a certain characteristic or ilk, what would that look like and be? So you've got ideal customer and the offering, ideal employee. Then you've got to really sort of look at the company and say, okay, what do they have to be the 
best at in the market to win? Don't answer the question if they are the best yet, but just look at what they're offering, whether it's business to business, B2B or B2C. Maybe it's complex. Maybe it's a government contractor. Try to answer that question. Just try. You don't have to be perfectly right. What do they need to be the very best at to win in their market? Right. So that's the third category. And then the fourth one is simply, what's preventing them from being the best? And if you say, well, they already are the best if they're number one, fine. What's preventing them from fortifying that? What's preventing them from growing? What's preventing them from creating a better employee experience? If maybe you've been challenged with that ideal employee, maybe it's tough to tell and they're sort of struggling right now with the ideal employee, work from home, work from office, these sort of trends come in here. So you can have this as a two by two box, just sticky notes and categories. That's the best way to sort of start and start to inventory this information. Okay, moving on, uh, you're gonna hear Janice talk about uh, how the business of law and her knowledge of it really helped her take on a new role, which is legal operations, which is fascinating and driving a lot of this. And she's gonna talk a little bit about um, her team and legal operations. So the business of law, was very critical uh, when I uh, started here. And because of the background that I brought, I think I was given that uh, operations piece of it. And I love it. I I think it's uh, showing people the data and the impact of that data literally after one year um, has been tremendous. Um, I can track billable hours for every single lawyer um, who works on our cases. Um, And so how much they bill us and how many hours that they're billing. What is the mix between partner versus associate versus paralegal um, on any of our our cases? Every month um, I get printouts of who billed me the most in in, in, in any given time frame in that month and uh, what's their billable rate. Uh, so we're tracking all of that. So, so I've got about, um, I think it is 19 people in that segment. And uh, they, they do, you know, what I, what I love, which is they do a lot of root cause analysis. Uh, so we have managing the outside council now, and this was a shift that we made after we did this project. Now that we only have 16, we've got about four people who are managing that relationship. One main guy who does all of the negotiations. And so if anybody asks for a fee increase, it all is going one place. He can literally look through the data and, and justify the fee increases, et cetera. So that's been great for him. He also, to manage these relationships, he tracks, for example, what benefits are we getting from these law firms? They, they offered us these benefits, are we taking advantage of the benefits? Um, we, he sets up meetings with all of the law firms on a quarterly basis to make sure that that relationship exists. Um, and then we're doing also some biannual meetings with the chief legal officer and, and several of the people who are working on the cases. Um, so he loves it because he's truly in that the heart of the business side um, and liaising with the law firms and also produces all of this fantastic data. Um, that I share with my colleagues and I get to share with the rest of the department about who are they hiring? How much is it costing? You know, are we, you know, taking advantage of the AFAs that we have? um, Or are we just kind of going out there and saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this project on the side. And we had a couple of those, they got shut down quickly. Uh, So so that's that's been good. Um, There are other people on the team that really help the entire law department Um, and and we have a large trial division as well. So with any kind of technology, so if we're putting in, for example, um, a document retention um, or a a document management system, they're managing all of the technology pieces for that because they know what they need to do. Yeah, they're some of them are lawyers, some of them have worked with the law department for a long time, so they really appreciate that. Um, so when, when we did I manage, for example, and Walter Sclore, some of those other um, uh, technology pieces that we have, they implement that across the entire um, law department. Um, we have others who are kind of you know, Six Sigma black belts who are going out there and literally saying, OK, how effective um, are the things that we have? How is our budget working? Um, and how do I, how do, what does our client think about us? So they will create and administer client surveys and then use the data from that to improve, you know, what, or, or tell us what we need to do to improve our relationships with the client um, and what kind of meetings we need to be going to as a part of the law department. So they 
really kind of enjoy that across the board look at the entire, and when I say law department, um, here it's government relations, compliance, um, and legal, that's all under one umbrella. So they get to look at all of those processes. Um, I'm hoping I'm not missing. Uh, so I think, I think that's primary because I think the we have the black belt and the Six Sigma team that we have, there are about three people there and there's four people that handle the outside council and all the rest of them. We Oh, we have um, under that umbrella, sorry. We have a data analytics and reporting team affectionately called DART. And so they can, um, they have Tableau and they can, you can feed them any bit of data and they can tell a story for you. Um, and that's that comes in from compliance. It comes in from our business lawyers and they do a lot of work for me in litigation because I, when I report to the board, I'm able to show the board variations year over year, types of litigation, spend everything based on the work that the DART team provides for me. A good overview of the legal operations team that Janice has. And let's just cover off. So there's there is a pricing uh, focus, there is a technology focus, there is a process focused, and then there's a data and data analytics and visualiz visualization focus. Those are just, just perfect examples of when I talk about lawyering in the modern era and why we need to build modern lawyers, and Janice is certainly one of them. Think about what she just dropped there. She's dropping pricing, technology, process, engineering, with the Lean Six Sigma black belts and data analytics and visualization. And this is in an in-house function. Now, yes, they have 500 some odd lawyers there. It's a big organization, but those capabilities and skills are becoming more and more vital to any legal team, big or small, law firm or in-house counsel. So our ability to just accept them and understand them as lawyers um, is, truly a strength is truly a competitive advantage and if we can really master those at some level well then you get to be one of the 16 as i call them you get to be chosen to work with these clients as they go through and ascertain whether their outside counsel has the goods or not to deliver on this stuff uh, i'm going to give you a quick little uh segment right here about how this is going how the panel reduction went and how it was accepted she's going to tell a really quick story of the power of data Lots of law firms may be like, oh my gosh, I would never want to work with this client. They're intrusive. They're looking into my billable hours down to the minute, down to, down to the person and all that. And But she's going to tell you a real quick story of how this actually benefited a law firm in terms of their rates. Listen to this. So far, it's been a positive reaction because frankly, the ones who have asked us for fee increases that we have provided, it's because of the data that we had that said, you know, clearly you haven't had a fee increase in three years. Here's all the work that you've done for us. Plus, we just made this new arrangement with you. And even under the new arrangement, you're not even making the money that we said you were going to make. So, it's, but the data actually showed us all of that. Whereas before it would have been, okay, we'll give them the fee increase. And we may have been upset about it because we didn't know, did they really deserve it? There you go. Because the client has really good data and discipline. They're actually able to help the law firm raise their rates. Who would have thunk it? Okay. Real quick uh, comment here by Janice, basically on how in-house clients actually are paying attention to law firm dynamics and changing practice groups in terms of their growth, their strategy, their value proposition. So unbeknownst to many law firms and partners and practice groups, clients are paying attention to what you're doing and the moves you're making in the market, right? And it probably serves you best to be proactive and go talk to them and explain it as you're going to hear here. On the growth piece, we have had conversations with a couple of law firms, one that does um, a lot of our intellectual property work, because they have been spreading like wildfire. And the conversation came up around when, when you grow this big, what's the fee arrangement going to be like? Because we have a fixed fee with them to do so many um, intellectual property cases um, and patent applications for us a year. And so is that going to change because they... Um, their footprint has broadened tremendously across the Midwest, um, in which we think is great, but sometimes they feel like they have to charge New York uh, rates. And what we'd like to do is pay that Midwest rate that we've been used to. So as they did that, we had those conversations. They assured us that that was not going to be a problem for us. Um, on the other side of that, we had a law firm that we did a lot of class action work with, 
that they actually broadened out and really got their um, firm to now focus a lot more on healthcare rather than on some of the cases that we were using them on. And so we had to diminish the relationship that we had with them because now their capabilities didn't match up with ours. Um, so it's, it's important to have those conversations to see where they're going. So who does she prefer to work with? Those firms that are there to just apply their legal excellence or to do that and become a business partner? She'll answer once again, just in case you haven't been paying attention. There's one firm we work with right now who they want to solve the business problem. And it, it's great. Uh, and so it, I love working with firms like that. I also have had a lot of firms that are just kind of like, well, we, we gave you the legal advice. You know, now you're supposed to go do something with it. And that's all we're going to focus on. Once you get out of the legal realm, you know, it's no longer our business. And so one of the things that uh, they like to say here at Nationwide, we were just we just had an um, executive leadership team meeting, and uh, one of the questions the CEO asks, he says, "Who here is in the business?" And if you are a support group and you didn't put your hand up, then that's not a good thing. We are all in the business. So I think that's a key piece for you know in-house counsel to understand is that you're not you know in-house counsel for just sake of being a lawyer. You're in the business. <laughs> and so you're looking at the legal issues, absolutely. And you're giving advice around the risks and the tolerances that the business has established. But you're also, I think, I think my role, and not everybody shares this because I have some colleagues here who I've been trying to talk through this with, mm -hmm. um, but that I think my role is to help the business solve their problems at the end of the day. There you go. I could not have said it better myself. We are all in the business, the business of our clients, whether you're in-house or you're representing that client. And the other thing to take away is we're all in the business of law. This conversation was all about the business of law and how that's a differentiator, how that helps law firms stand out. So whether you're a partner or associate or you're a business professional inside a law firm, a conversation like this is rich with insight. Help your firm, help your practice group more specifically devise a value proposition, a differentiating capability as to how you might win the work of a client like this. Just go through that motion. Work on your business, on your business of law, your law practice. That's your business. Work on that. Just don't work in it every day practicing law or just doing the things that we do every day. Take a moment. Think about this conversation, what new insight you've gathered. Think about the clients you're working with and how might you start to devise a value proposition, a differentiator, a competitive advantage for your practice group. Take care.